السلام عليكم الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا رسول الله وأشهد أن محمدا رسول الله حي الأصل حي الأصل حي الأوفل حي الأوفل الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام نستعينه ونستحله ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم وبعد. We begin by acknowledging Allah, praising Allah, and perhaps most importantly for this discussion, for this khutbah I should say, is we praise Allah for the blessing of Islam. Alhamdulillahi ala ni'mat al-Islam. For the blessing of Islam. And among the blessings or the bounties or benefits of Islam, this deen which has come forth through all of the prophets and being completed with the coming of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. Among those blessings is the blessing of Ramadan. It's true that other faith traditions other religions have fasting in some form of another. However, the, the experience of Ramadan cannot be justly compared to any of those other faith traditions or any of those other religions when it comes to fasting. Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون. Allah says, O oh believers, fasting is an obligation on you, as it was on those before you. For what reason? لعلكم تتقون. That the purpose of fasting is so that perhaps you will develop in taqwa. So the body and the soul are in need of retreat from the physical from time to time. In other words, it's in need of a break from time to time. So it is retreat, withdrawing or restraining from that which we are accustomed to, to taking in, that allows us to, or, or I should say forces us to be in a position in a better position at least, to receive God's guidance in a way that proves to be beneficial for this life as well as the next life. With regards to fasting, the Bible says that Jesus, Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, that he retreated into the wilderness and fasted. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the final prophet of Allah, 
he retreated, his form of retreat, he went to the cave on what we today call the Mountain of Light, Jabal al-Nur. Similarly, Moses, Musa alayhi salam, peace be upon him, Moses is, went to a certain uh, valley, you know, retreating from his family, uh, expecting to find some sort of guidance there. So, retreat is difficult. Especially considering the nature of the world in which we live in today. Because the nature of the world in which we live in today, almost everyone and everything is connected. And it's almost inescapable. Distractions are particularly abundant these days. You don't even need a television anymore. If you have your cell phone, that's a distraction already. So, returning to the ayah from the, from the Qur'an's second chapter, Surah, Surah Al-Baqarah. It says that the purpose of fasting is to develop taqwa. But it uses a word, which... I don't know if we focus on this word often, but it uses a word. And the word is تتكون. And la'alla means perhaps, maybe, more than likely, but not necessarily guaranteed. And actually I had a, a, a conversation with a, a couple of, uh, of scholars about this point. We sort of argued this point, which is another issue, but... The, nevertheless, the ayah uses the word la'alla. And the word la'alla acknowledges, or I should say the Qur'an acknowledges, that there is a chance of failure. That's very hard to hear. But there is a chance of failure. Meaning that you fast and you feel like you, you obtain nothing from the fast except hunger and thirst. That you became angry, or you feel as if you haven't um, grown spiritually as a result of fasting. There's a chance of that to happen. There's a chance of failure. So, what do we do when we fail, or if we fail? What do we do? Allah Jalla Sha'nuhu gives us. The answer in Ramadan itself. We keep going. We keep striving. That's the, that's the answer. That's the solution. We keep at it. If one day of fasting we feel that we feel that we have failed, that we have obtained little or nothing from it, well, you have the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. The same thing with prayer. And perhaps prayer is a more potent example because Ramadan is only one month out of the year, whereas prayer for the practicing Muslim is done daily. So what happens if you pray and you were thinking about that game last night between the Cavs and the Celtics? <laughs> or you're thinking about your business. Or you're thinking about your paper. Or you're thinking about your money. You're thinking about this or that. What happens when you pray to Allah and you feel as if you've got nothing from the prayer? What happens? What, what should you do? And this is a, a serious question that has confronted theologians and people that not just follow the religion of Islam, but other religions as well. Historically. What do you do? You keep going. I think this is one of the blessings of having a religion that has Five daily prayers, not just a prayer in the, in, the, in the morning and a prayer at night. It has five daily prayers. Because if you feel as if you, 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 you have failed in connecting to Allah in prayer, well, you have the chance for the next prayer, and the next prayer, and the next prayer. Returning to the subject of the month of Ramadan... I would suggest that we set life goals in Ramadan, or what they call New Year's, New Year's resolutions. Why not Ramadan resolutions? 
Why not? Why not Ramadan resolutions? And going back to the theme of taqwa, if Ramadan is, is given in order for us to develop taqwa, then any, any resolutions that we make should likewise be based upon taqwa. Uh, have a foundation in taqwa. Have a foundation in that which is lawful and goodly in the sight of Allah. And not in that which is haram or unlawful in the sight of Allah. So, I have proposed that making resolutions in the month of Allah makes the experience of fasting more meaningful. Whose influence will be felt not just in the life to come, but the life in here and the life in the here and the now. We conclude the first section of the khutbah with a prayer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our fasting and our acts of worship and any good that we do. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي ونسلم على رسوله الكريم وبعد. We praise Allah and we ask that Allah's peace and blessings be upon His Prophet, the Fallen Prophet, صلى الله عليه وسلم وبعد. I want to return to the idea or the subject of taqwa for just a moment because taqwa is not a game nor is taqwa a one time experience and to give some examples of one time experiences you know we we live in a religious culture that has elements in it that uh, that speak about miracles that people expect a miracle just as moses spoke to god uh, through through the uh, prism of a of a flame or or, or Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was spoken to God through the prism of, a, of an angel, the angel Gabriel. You know, people expect miracles, or, or um, perhaps better examples, um, speaking in tongues. All of a sudden, someone having a normal conversation, and the person starts, you know, uh, saying things in some tongue, some that some language that nobody else understands. So. Taqwa, again, is not a one-time, a one-moment experience. Taqwa is a continuous process of spiritual development. So, and I know this part is perhaps controversial, but I think that if, if, uh, if you allow me, uh, it will not be as controversial as it sounds. The Qur'an gives us only hints. It gives us broad statements. It gives us general statements or general ideas or general principles. That's all it does. It is, it, 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 you know, th- th- let me use this example. You'll never see a recipe for fried chicken in the Quran. <laughs> you'll never see that kind of, fr- you'll never see that sort of, is that sort of uh, thing there? Let me share. A, let me share a historical story. <clears throat> the story is this: It is attributed to Imam Shafi'i, rahmatullahi taala alayhi, one of the great uh, classical scholars. One of the schools of thought in Sunni Islam is named after him, Imam Shafi'i. Story says that he was arguing with an atheist, one, or an atheist came to him, and he says, "You know, in in the Quran, it says." that God has placed everything in the Qur'an, right? That everything is, you know, is given there. All things are explained in, in the Qur'an, right? Imam says yes. So, so the man says, the, the atheist, Mulhid, atheist, he says, okay. Where does it say how to make bread in the Qur'an? You know, where does it say in the book? Where's the recipe for baking bread? So Imam says, you know, let me get back to you. I got to find it for you. 
So, you know, sometime later, the atheist comes out, where is it? Where is the verse on baking bread? So he quotes the ayah, is, is mentioned uh, three times in different ways. Ask those who have knowledge if you don't know. So he says, what is that you're talking about? He said, well, I did was, I went and asked the baker how to bake bread, and he told me. <laughs> so the Quran gives us broad statements, and it is to those who are a little bit better educated than we are to look at the text in all of its aspects, in all of its essence, and to essentially break it down. And I admit that all of this is subjective. I mean, even the example from Imam al-Shafari before, maybe some people don't like bread. So maybe the example wouldn't work. Nonetheless, so long as it all falls under the pale of Allah's book, and within the sunnah of Allah's Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa the final prophet, it is, a worth, it is worth examining, particularly for those in positions of preaching and teaching religion. So the great spiritualist, Imam Abu Hamid Muhammad al-Ghazali, or simply Imam al or simply Imam al-Ghazali. He has some observations about the fast that I would like to share. And so he, he writes that the community of those fasting are divided into three, three categories. The first, he says, regular people, al-awam, regular people. The second, peop, the second group, he calls them the elites. And the third group, he calls the selected calls them the selected. And again, the term, the first category, regular people, civilians, if you will, he means the average masses among the Muslims. You know, we have at least a billion Muslims in the world. So he are, so just the, the average, the average Joe Blow or the average Muhammad Ali, not the boxer, the average Muhammad Ali on the streets in, in, or in the masjids of the, of, of, among the Muslim community. And so the first group are the people for whom we all share the same rules and regulations about you're supposed to fast, eat, uh, you're supposed to uh, stop eating at Fajr, and, and you can allow to eat again at the Maghrib and so forth. Then there are no more rules that we all know. The elites, the second category, the elites, he describes them, are those who when fasting think only about Allah. That's how he describes it. That, that, that when they're fasting, they're, their only thoughts are about Allah. In fact, he gives an example in his, in his book. He says, you know, if you're thinking about, oh, what am I preparing for dinner today for, for the iftar, then that in itself is a violation of the spirit of the fast. That's how he argues. And for some reason, he makes a division. I think it's, it could be inverted. Because logically, it seems like it's inverted. But this is the division that he made. So the third category, which is what I really wanted to, wanted to focus on, he calls it the selected. Actually, let me back up a little bit. So I said that the elites are those who, when fasting, he describes it, the Imam al-Ghazali, as those who think only about Allah when fasting. And so he goes on to say that this level is the level of the prophets. And this is the level of the righteous. And the, a couple of verses from, from the fourth surah came to my mind. In which it says, And those giving obedience to Allah and the messenger, فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصَّدِّقِينَ وَالشُهَدَاءِ وَالصَّالِحِينَ he says that those giving obedience to Allah, the Messenger, such are with those on whom Allah has given blessing. Among the prophets, the truthful, the witnesses, and the righteous, and an excellent company they are. So perhaps we can see uh, 
those two verses, it's actually verses, verses 6, 9, and 70 of, of, this, of the fourth surah. Perhaps you can see those as a sort of commentary, or the imam making commentary on that, Imam al Fasali. So, normal obedience, the things that we, we take for granted, you know, the praying five times a day and not eating pork, and, and, and not drinking alcohol and all those things, Perhaps we can see the normal experience can already raise your, your level already, even though you may not have the, the, uh, the t-shirt that says it. So, yet, Imam al-Ghazali, he gives, he speaks about the third category. This is what I will, what I will look at, the selected. And so he says there are six ways to perfect the fast. And these are the ways of those who are selected. He uses the term selected. So the perfection of fasting lies in six things. Perhaps uh, next time, maybe we'll take a, like a PowerPoint presentation. I know it's hard to, to remember all this stuff. So the first way he mentions, there's only six. So the first thing he mentions is to restrain the eye from looking at that which distracts from Allah, particularly that which influences carnal appetites. And think about our television shows that we watch. The second thing he mentions is to restrain the tongue from vain talk. The third thing he mentions, I'm trying to go this rather quickly. The third thing he mentions is restraining the ears from listening to improper things. The fourth thing he mentions is to restrain hands, feet, and body parts from indecencies. And come to think of it, there, are, there we have it in Surah Yasin, we have it in another uh, ayah, I think it's Surah Al-Isra, in which it talks about the, the body parts, you know, the, the, the hands and the feet, you know, uh, being questioned. You know, and, 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 and in essence, and there's, there's a tafsir about this, but in essence, that on Judgment Day, that the body parts will say, I, I had nothing to do with it. No, it wasn't me. I had nothing to do with it. I was forced. <laughs> the fifth thing he mentions is to restrain from breaking one's fast from that which have which has some doubt. So I'm not sure if a happy meal would be a you know acceptable iftar. I, I'll I'll share another joke. One of one of the, one of my friends he says that I can prove to you that McDonald's is completely and totally halal. That's okay. Even the pork. That's okay, I'm listening. He says it's not meat anyway, it's plastic. <laughs> <laughs> I had no comeback to that. <laughs> so the sixth thing he mentions, which is really deep, Remember, six ways to perfect one's fasting. To be, at the sixth and final thing, to be apprehensive, meaning to wonder whether or not Allah accepted your fast or not. I think that's a very deep thing. Because you can, you, can you can do all of the rules. And just like with prayer too, you can do all the rules, your feet can be at the right place, and you, you wash all the necessary parts in the, in the ablution. And you can be dressed the right way, and, and all of that. But does that mean that Allah will accept your prayer? Maybe if your heart is not in it, then how can you say Allah accept it? So again, the sixth part, the sixth aspect. To be apprehensive, meaning to wonder whether or not Allah has actually accepted your fasting. So, in other words, we are not to be... Um, Arrogant or complacent is a better term. We're not to be complacent. We actually have to think about does God accept our, our fasting? Now, these six statements are not statements that are given directly in the Quran and in the Hadith. They are, they are extrapolated, these are principles that are extrapolated from the Islamic texts. <coughs> And the extrapolation requires work. You can't simply Google it. You might find some information on Google, but 
for, for, for information like this or insights like this, it requires work. Particularly for those who teach us religion. And there are some people who have already done a lot of work. And this is why I, I mentioned these, uh, the, the source of this. This is Imam al-Ghazali. It's not my source. It's not me coming up with something. This is Imam al-Ghazali. So work has to be done. And work will con- or should continuously be done. But back to Ramadan itself for, for us. Ramadan is a perfect chance. It's a great chance to, to work and to work hard. To, to consider our position in life, to consider our spiritual position in life, because uh, the spiritual position is arguably the most important position for a believer. To, to really look at ourselves and to see where we need work. So, we should be, as we said in the beginning of the, of the khutbah, be thankful to Allah. Alhamdulillahi ala ni'matul Islam. To be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the blessing of Islam. Because, I mean, we are a minority. We're not even 1% of the population in the United States. So 99% of people are not going to hear this or care. They're not going to hear this or care. So, shouldn't we see this as a blessing? Even though we restrain ourselves and all that, shouldn't we see this as a blessing? Because in that restraint, in the ma'al yusra, because in that restraint, or in those hardships, because fasting can be hard, and a lot of things that we do can be hard. But in that hardship, relief comes. In the Rasul Yusra. فَإِذَا فَرَقَدَ فَنْسَرَ وَإِلَى رَبِّكَ فَرَقَبْ We pray unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the words of His Prophet, to show us truth as truth. And give us the ability to follow it. And to show us falsehood as falsehood. And give us the ability to abstain therefrom. Allahumma anu haqqa haqqa wa zukna tiba'a. Wa anu al-baat li baat wa zukna ishtinaba. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana. Wa fi l-akhrati hasana. Wa qina a'zab al-nar. Rabbana la taj'anna ma'ad al-qawm al-zalimeen. Rabbana amanna faktubna ma'a al-shahideen. ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ حتيتنا وحب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا إنك جامع الناس ليوم لا ريب فيه إن الله لا يخف ميعاد سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين رب العالمين وأقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا وكتابا الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حلو صلاة حلو فلاك أقمت الصلاة أقمت الصلاة الله